Thank you very much, Peter. Good evening, everyone. Well, we had such an excellent introduction last week with Pastor Doug to the book of 1 Timothy. It's almost unnecessary to go over anything of the introduction again, but I will, because I've reached that age in life when uh, a bit of a, a reminder, even for me, is a good thing. The book was written... Sorry, the letter was written by Paul in the mid-60s AD between Paul's two imprisonments in Rome as described in Acts 28. It was written to Timothy at the church at Ephesus, a troubled church who was already experiencing difficulties. It was one of the three pastoral epistles, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. 2,000 years ago, written to this church, a church, a Christian gathering, they've only just started Jesus has ascended to the Father a mere three or so decades beforehand, and already false teaching and falling away from the faithful is taking place. The gospel is being corrupted or modified. The law is being incorrectly applied. Imagine the scene. A couple of disciples of Jesus approach a lone man sitting at the roadside. They talk briefly about things in general, life and all its vagaries and uncertainty. Then they begin to tell the man about Jesus, his life and his death on the cross, how through repentance of sins and faith in him who sent him, eternal life was offered as a gift through the grace of God. The man listens. He seems intrigued but doubting. He smiles good-naturedly. Then he speaks. I must go. My bus is here. My wife has recorded EastEnders on the telly, and we always watch it together. Tony asks him to shut his eyes, and he will give him a gift. A tract, or a John's Gospel. I've forgotten the exact significance of the shutting of the eyes. I like to think of it as receiving in trust and faith, as we do from our Saviour, Jesus. Of course, this is us, Worthing Tabernacle, Saturday Conversations, 2,000 or so years later than Paul's letter. The same people needing to hear the gospel, the same people in spirit, in disbelief, wanting to believe another gospel, the same people wanting to believe false teaching within the culture. EastEnders, false teaching, that's stretching it a bit, isn't it, Mark? Well, yes and no. Tim Keller, the American preacher, tells us that as Christians, we are to maintain a faithful witness presence in society, both as individuals and as a church. That is to influence our society, our world, our culture from within, to bring the good news of salvation to this world. Faithful, that is, to Jesus and the gospel, not allowing ourselves to be enticed into wrongdoing or a false gospel, to be distracted or knocked off course by life's inevitable setbacks, a witness telling others of our life-changing faith, a presence being there for people, serving, loving, as did our Saviour Jesus. Having said that, the storyline of EastEnders does take a bit of getting used to, not for the faint-hearted. Of course, no one takes it seriously. Or do they? These storylines are often what's thought to constitute the way to happiness or success in our modern culture. The characters are always seeking happiness or success in the usual places. If I could just get that girl to go out with me, meaning love is the answer to fulfilment in life. If I could just get that wonderful job, meaning work and money is the answer to fulfilment in life. If I could just get away from those nagging parents, meaning independence and being my own person is the answer to fulfilment in life. Now, of course, these things are all well and good. They're absolutely fine in their place. Who wouldn't want to be employed, earning their own living, being in a loving relationship, feeling independent? However, we run the risk of making a good thing an ultimate thing. Again, quoting Keller. We can easily become fixated on the wrong thing. Ultimate things or idols of the heart will perish. Jobs will be lost. Partners and loved ones might leave. 
money may be spent or just run out. Let's see what Paul says to Timothy about keeping the main thing the main thing, building your life on Jesus. Tonight's verses really just emphasize three points or ideas from this wonderful letter of Paul's. One, Jesus came to save us from our sins. Two, this is good news, the best news. Let's share it and let it change our hearts. Three, keep focused and persevere. Love and value the church. Paul starts in verse 12. Let's dive straight in. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Paul delights in the fact that he has been chosen to serve, knowing he has received faith and the ability to repent purely by the grace of God. He's completely undeserving, as are we. Paul had spent much of his life thus far systematically persecuting Jesus' followers. Paul had been judged faithful, not because of what he's done, but because God had made him so. What a thought to rejoice in. Recently, again, during Saturday conversations, we spoke to a young lady who said Christianity was a lazy religion. When pressed to explain that, she said that we were merely tailgating Jesus into, the, into eternity. We were relying on somebody else's work. We weren't really doing anything very much ourselves. He'd done it all, and we were just grateful to be part of the plan and to be included in it. And it was ironic because she did actually had encapsulated the gospel, although she, she didn't believe it, sadly. But she said it was lazy. I hadn't thought of it that way, but, uh, you know, a strange way of saying things. Paul recounts in his defence before King Agrippa in Acts 26 the words spoken to him by Jesus at his conversion but are just as applicable to us, to witness to Christ and the hope of salvation through Jesus. Jesus' words in Acts 26, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I appear to you delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. St. Augustine, the 4th century theologian, wrote, God does not choose a person who is worthy, but by the act of choosing him, he makes him worthy. It's a very humbling thought, I found. Now, of course, Paul had the amazing privilege of hearing the direct speech of Jesus, of being caught up to the third heaven, as he describes in 2 Corinthians 12.2, at his conversion. But God speaks into our lives often just as clearly. We too have this wonderful privilege of being chosen. Do we ever worry in our darker moments about the seeming miracle of being chosen by God, of his great love for us and indeed our salvation? Is it too good to be true? Why me? A quote whose origin I've sadly forgotten is... The pain of his absence, God's, is the proof of his presence. If you're worrying about God, he's already at work in your heart. Those who profess unbelief in God simply don't care about such matters. They barely give it a moment's thought. When I was sitting in my hotel room in Spain, when God, the Holy, the Holy Spirit, spoke into my life, I had all sorts of wonderful ideas of getting right with God, of, of meeting him halfway, of getting my act together. We were going to read the Bible and come to church and we'd meet him halfway. We'd do our bit, fair enough, God would do his. And of course, this is absolute nonsense, as we know. We're saved purely by grace. As though I could possibly have saved myself, as though any of us could have saved ourselves. Paul continues in verse 13. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. He hadn't received faith yet. When he was still a Pharisee, he was going around persecuting the new followers of Jesus, and he didn't know what he was doing, but he condemns the people of the church of Ephesus who are professing faith but are doing wrong. They've got no excuse. 
They are saying they have understood the gospel and are abusing it. Paul knows only too well that no one earns salvation. He feels he's been treated with great mercy because he had acted in ignorance and unbelief. This shows, of course, God's grace and merciful forgiveness. As Jesus says in Luke 12, 48, with just a touch of warning for those who should know better, Jesus speaking says, but the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And for, from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. And then, of course, Jesus' words on the cross, Luke 23, 34. Jesus speaks and says, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So we've all been shown great mercy and grace by God. Hopefully, we've not spent years before becoming Christians blaspheming and opposing God, but if we have been brought to faith in later life, as I was, we haven't spent years enjoying God's gifts, but ignoring the giver. Yet still, even if we have, the Lord has mercy on us and sends his Holy Spirit to bring us the ability to repent and have faith. He does it all. What an amazing God. However, one verse of warning from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, if we are near believers or new believers, what can we do to be more open to the Holy Spirit who brings us faith and the ability to repent? Again, Hebrews offers some comforting words of truth. Chapter 11, verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is the real basics, the real nuts and bolts. Believe he exists and trust he will reward your seeking of him. Press in, seek God, come to church, pray to God to make himself known and close to you. Read the scriptures, talk to Christian friends. Paul tells us what to expect when we do these things, what to expect of our merciful and loving God in verse 14. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Matthew Henry, the 17th century commentator, wrote, The conversion and salvation of great sinners are owing to the grace of Christ. He is exceedingly abundant grace, even that grace of Christ which appears in his glorious gospel. This is the description of Jesus. He is love, and this is the hallmark of the Christian. The unfakeable fruit of the Spirit is love. Love for God and our neighbours. This love will be shown in action, how we treat each other and the non-believing world. How we put others first, serving others, and even trying to be Christ-like. Any false or counterfeit teaching will not lead to love being shown, but often will manifest a selfishness, a me-centred approach to life in and out of church. Let us always rejoice that salvation is received, not achieved. Let us be centred on our Saviour Jesus, not ourselves. A few words here about faith and its strength and how we worry over our faith. It comes to us all in our darker moments. We're rightly told that faith is not, it's not the strength of our faith that's so important, but the object of our faith. And this is, of course, true. We're putting our faith in a mighty and loving God. A small amount of our faith in such an amazing God is fine. This, of course, is true. But I'm reminded of uh, an illustration that's been used from uh, Exodus, the book of Exodus, chapter 14. The people of Israel are crossing the Red Sea. The, they've escaped from the slavery in Egypt under Pharaoh. Moses is leading them to salvation through the Red Sea. He's parted the waters. God has parted the waters. And they're going through. 
They're escaping the slavery, of course the analogy is the slavery of sin, to salvation on the other side. And of course, as with all people, there will be people like myself who will be absolutely terrified, looking up at this wall of water on each side, absolutely petrified, waiting at any moment that it's going to come down on me, thinking, oh no, please, please, probably it'll happen in the middle at the furthest point from the land, why that would make any difference, I don't know. And then there could be somebody walking along beside me, thinking, wow, this is great, looking up, look, I can see fish and weeds and tra- plants and trees and things, absolutely oblivious to any danger. But of course, the moral, the truth of the story is, we both get to the other side, we both survive, we both are saved. The one who has little faith and the one who has great faith. So Paul has talked so far about his testimony, his experience of the love of God. He now goes on to summarize the gospel and show himself as an example of God's mercy and patience towards all repentant sinners. Verse 15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. The summation of the gospel Jesus came to save sinners, and Paul was a great offender. Repent and believe. The worse sinner is that repents, the greater the glory to God. There's hope for us all, as Paul in his previous life had been a shocker. This shows the suffering of our Lord on the cross, what he's prepared to do, the Son of God, born as man, living a sinless life, without fault, dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Again, Matthew Henry pens these words, those who are sensible of their obligations to the mercy and grace of God will have their hearts enlarged in his praise. Paul goes on to tell Timothy in verse 16 how Jesus shows us all his amazing patience and reluctance to condemn or judge but his earnest desire that all may have come to a saving faith in him. Verse 16, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Matthew Henry again says he was converted and obtained mercy for the sake of others as well as himself. He was a pattern to others. Let us be a pattern to others. Let us be an example, a witness to Jesus as we live out our lives. Jesus' love shown through the patience and mercy. Hope for us, as indeed there was for Paul at his conversion, shows us so clearly. Hope even to everlasting life. Hebrews again, 10.39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith preserve their souls. This is the hope of eternal life with Jesus. Now all this writing to Timothy about his salvation, the love and patience of God, the real hope of eternity in the presence of God, proves quite rightly too much for Paul. And he just bursts into this wonderful doxology of verse 17. This spontaneous declaration of praise and worship. He just can't help himself. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul bursts into praise as he considers God's grace to him. So should we. Burst into praise. Consider the cross and our salvation. Daily, hourly. Count our many blessings. And yes, look on the bright side. When stuff goes wrong in life, as it will, we will experience suffering. Think what God is teaching me. Not easy, I know. I've had to do that myself. What can I learn even from painful experiences? Trust God. He is sovereign and sees all. Paul now turns his personal address to his much-loved Timothy. He urges Timothy to remember the spiritual encouragement received previously to complete his mission. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. 
Matthew Henry says, the gospel is a charge committed to the ministers of it. A weighty duty, but a joy. Now, Timothy had obviously received spiritual encouragement, possibly similar to Saul and Barnabas in Acts 13.2, where while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work in which I have called them. However, we too know as part of our calling by the Holy Spirit that we are part of this plan to wage good, the good warfare. Timothy had a divine calling, but so do we, don't we? Are we not commanded to always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect? 1 Peter 3.15 Paul restates here the need to fight the false teaching of verses 3 to 7. That is, teaching a different doctrine, not the gospel, of myths, of genealogies, and of just vain discussion, and so on. That we, like Timothy, should stick to sound teaching and recognise any deviation from the gospel at once. This verse so lovingly shows us, too, this relationship in Christ, that Paul and Timothy share this calling of Timothy, my child, the great affection Paul has for his protege. This is discipling as it should be. Paul, the mature Christian, loving and supporting the younger Timothy. Let's all try to emulate this nurturing in our church. Verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Paul unites faith and good conscience, where faith is a personal faith in Jesus and a commitment to Jesus, and good conscience, which is the Greek expression for the Hebrew pure heart. This faith and pure heart are what we see in prayer and worship, in reading the scriptures. It's a gift of God, his grace. We can, however, play our part through keeping these practices. The ones rejecting this in verse 19, the ones who are perhaps not fully embracing the gospel, may have not been true believers at all, having professed faith but fallen away. 1 John 19, John discussing what he describes as the Antichrists, says, They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us but they went out, that it might become plain that they were all are not of us. So as always, we're encouraged to persevere in our Christian life or walk, always to strengthen each other in love and serving as we wait for Jesus' return. Paul continues in verse 20, Among those who have fallen Pray to these false teachings, etc., are Hymenus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. These two people are possibly the ones mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. They're probably mentioned in 2 Timothy 2.17, where Hymenus is talked about and Alexander is talked about in Acts 19.33. Now, handing over to Satan... It sounds a bit harsh. It seems a bit harsh. What does handed over to Satan actually mean? And it's probably quite interesting to important to look at two schools of thought. The, the first one is simply that this means being put outside the church, put outside the protection of the spirit-filled church, where they might see the devil as he is and come to repentance. A chance to be restored or even brought to faith initially, and most importantly, to do no harm to the church. Or the devil might be allowed to inflict some illness or infirmity on them, as in Job 2.6. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. Both these possibilities have at their heart a process of restoration and spiritual healing, and not just punishment. Although removal from the assembly of the church, the Christian gatherings would have seemed like punishment enough to Paul. Put out of the church disciplined but not punished, and above all, to protect those of the congregation. What wonderful teaching there is in these few verses, so few and yet so full. Paul has reminded us of the gospel. Jesus has come to save us 
from our sins. This salvation through Jesus is the best news ever. Share it. Church should be our safe haven. Persevere in your Christian life. Love the church. Well, we began this evening by viewing our world through the eyes of the BBC and EastEnders. Not especially edifying, I might hazard. Let's finish on a happier example from the television situation comedy. Again, I'm showing my age. Porridge with Ronnie Barker and the Richard Beckinsale. The story is set in Slade Prison. Fletcher is often giving advice to his young cellmate, Lenny, and he gives advice on almost every aspect of life, it would seem, but one recurring theme, one refrain that crops up is he advises him to keep your nose clean, bide your time, and don't let the others grind you down. Now, I've replaced a rude word for others. <coughs> Keep your nose clean. Avoid sin and battle against sin. Seek the fellowship in church with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Bide your time. Wait patiently but alertly for the return of our Lord and Saviour Jesus. Always ready for his return and the consummation of his kingdom. Don't let the others grind you down. Be in the world, but not of the world. Be a faithful witness presence, always ready and willing to show the love to others that is in Christ Jesus. Amen.